Okay, hi everyone. Good evening, and uh, uh, it's really my pleasure and privilege to invite uh, Adarsh Nair for the speaker series for today. Um, so I know Adarsh doesn't need too much of an introduction, but let me try and do whatever I can in the next one minute without taking too much of time from him, uh, away from him. That is. Um, so Adarsh is, I mean, so I spoke to Adarsh a few, exactly before the beginning of second wave, uh, and before that we've had one more conversation where he, again, very you know, generously contributed his time towards a podcast series that I and a friend of mine were doing. Every time I speak to him, I walk away with a series of insights that are highly valuable for me when I address the students um, in class. Um, this is my segue into the practice, into the world of practice. And I think I've learned a lot from every time that I spoke with Adarsh and he's also, and I'm also working with him and his team to hopefully see the, you know, to, to get a case study, uh, see the light of the day. Uh, but for wave two, it would have been done by now, I guess. A quick introduction, Adarsh is the CEO, Chief Product Officer, Chief Experience Officer with Airtel uh, for the last three years. Before that, he had a, you know, very diverse and, uh, um, you know, diverse career spanning McKinsey, Microsoft, and a bunch of tech analytics firms. Um, um, and I think it's really a cool way to, uh, I mean, to, to introduce our students to the world of practice and the senior leadership. And I couldn't think of a better person to be addressing uh, the class, honestly. So um, just others to start you off. Uh, first off, thanks, thanks a lot for agreeing to speak to the students. Second off, I would like to start you off with a quick question, um, just so that um, we could channel the conversation, right? I'm sure you'll agree with me when, uh, and I'm sure we've spoke about it, you and I, in the past as well. I'm sure you'll agree with me that this entire argument of digital transformation has, you know, is no longer a buzzword that people throw around to show off. I mean, it is the way in which I think the firms are happening. The firms are, um, you know, transforming themselves. Traditional firms are changing themselves. Um, I think more importantly, I'm sure we all agree that digitize, uh, digital transformation is not about digitizing a few processes here and there. It is a change in the culture of an organization with a certain objectives um, in mind. Uh, so in this case, um, you have a traditional telecom company. Um, Airtel, um, which has been seasoned, uh, which, which was a seasoned player in the mobile uh, market. And suddenly one day you hear this fancy term called Airtel Digital. Um, and pretty much any conversation surrounding Airtel after that is about Airtel Digital. So therefore, I think maybe it makes sense uh, for you to build your talk on two dimensions, given this context. The first one's if you could talk about what Airtel Digital means, what's the revolution that you're seeing in the market out there as you speak, you know, what is digital transformation and where is it coming from and why is it necessary, not so necessary, where is it fancy, where is it not fancy? A quick and, uh, you know, a quick introduction to this entire term called digital. Sure. Second sure. question I have is, well, when you're talking about any kind of transformation, be it cultural or be it digital, et cetera, et cetera, for somebody who is in the industry, well, sometimes you adapt or you become a dinosaur and you know, become extinct. But for somebody who is starting their career, aspiring to get into middle management and then build a career towards senior management in the years to come, how do you think about their mental structure, their uh, you know, their uh, mental makeup, if you will, uh, should be as they approach this question of careers. I mean, whichever order you're comfortable with, you could take that, but I would think that Airtel first, and then you talk about careers later. I have a couple of other follow-up questions that I'd like to pose, but I'd rather let you speak to the, uh, to the students first, and then I can always come back at a later stage. Shruti, kindly unpin me and let others be the focus of attention right now. Thanks a lot. Thanks a ton, Shra. I mean, so the, both are fantastic questions, right? So what I'll do today is I've, based on your guidance, prepared some material. So let me share that. And I'll try to keep it a conversation. Sure. If you've got um, questions in the middle of conversation, just raise your hand. More than happy to take it. Alternatively, we'll finish it and then give some time for conversation. We've got about 90 minutes today. So that's ample time, right? So without much ado, let me just jump in. 
and share this with you guys. <clears throat> Everybody can see this? Good. So I'm going to tackle the, the first question that got asked today, right? And I'll try to make it a story as much as I can. And it's, it's a fun story. So Etel's digital vision. So this was back in uh, 2018. Uh, I was working with a startup called Convoy. And that was a fun ride on its own, right? We were uh, marking territory towards becoming a unicorn. And we were in the preparation for our CDC, which is when I got the chance to you know, hear from Gopal, who's the CEO of Etel today. And uh, it was a very interesting conversation that I was having with him. He was talking about this big change happening in India with this company called Geo that was doing all this fancy stuff. And the real question was that meant telecoms had to evolve. And the question was, should Etel have a chief product officer to help this transformation? So, you know, in, in, in many dimensions, that was a interesting conversation for me. One, because uh, telecoms typically don't have product officers. Uh, two, I hadn't heard a lot about Geo at that time because I was working in the US. Of course, I got to know later about the kind of revolution that was going on in India with the telecom industry led by Geo. The second construct was a telecom evolving. And through the nature of work that I'd done in my past, I'd worked with the likes of Verizon, T-Mobile in the US, you know, typically from an analytics perspective. And uh, it's a pretty insurmountable challenge to get a company of that scale to evolve. Um, so the, the first conversation I had with Gopal was around, why do you want to evolve? Because I want to understand if the core foundation for evolution was even there. And one very interesting thing I heard was the industry structure, right? Close to 30% of the total revenue was wiped out from the telecom industry in 2018. 30% of the total revenue. Um, nine companies had closed shop in the telecom space, leaving behind an Airtel uh, Vodafone idea and then BSNL along with Geo. So for me, it was in what I call the apple moment. Nothing more can actually go wrong. So it is one of those very interesting moments in time where you could evolve, you could get better. So I found that opportunity interesting. And then of course I had a long conversation with uh, my peers who worked here in India about the potential to actually go, you know, be a winner in the market because I had no interest in coming down and be part of a story, which is a ship going down. So that, that's when, you know, we realized there was a small opportunity, whether we could translate the opportunity into action or not was a question mark, but the opportunity literally today, we capture in these four circles that you see in front of you. And the real question was who is Etel? And the then management was honestly confused because they knew Etel was a telecom company but everybody's talking about something called digital. So there was investments being made in a music platform, investments being made in a video platform. And then when I asked the question about, so where do you want to go? I heard advertising platform, devices platform, agri-tech platform, health platform. And for a second there, I stepped back and I said, no company on planet earth can actually build all those at one go and still win. So probably not a wise decision especially for a company like Etel, where we were not riding high on the cash flow versus our competitor had a lot of access to cash flow from another business. So for those of you doing an MBA, it's almost a perfect kind of strategy case to dissect. What does the CEO do in that situation, right? I had the opportunity to sit down with Gopal and then Sunil to have that conversation. So what does a company like Etel do? See the, the, the great answer that we came up with, which has been the backbone of our strategy for the last three years is we got to be true to our core. If we are somebody today, very rarely do you benefit by saying, I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'm going to transform myself completely into something else. There might be a few examples of that working in general. I wouldn't call that wisdom because you built something over the years. There must be some value to it, right? What you see in the center of these four circles is our core, the mobility business, the broadband business, the B2B business, and DTH. That's our core. Our journey started in the core. So one of the things I emphasized on was whatever you do, whatever digital you want to do, it has to start at the core. Okay. So today we're going to spend some time on the core, then talk about this concept of platforms, 
talk about the new businesses we are doing today because three years in i'm happy to say that we've got some new businesses we've spun up and then how partnerships brings it all together so these four rings forms the atl digital ecosystem and we discussed this idea back in 2018 drawing inspiration from the likes of amazon from the likes of google who all have ecosystem strategies in place ecosystem strategy is a reinforcing strategy you got some assets you sweat the assets more and you build new things that makes your core assets even stronger so that's when you get an ecosystem network effect right so these four circles i'm going to dissect today as i finish the dissection you'll also probably get a good sense of what is atl and where does atl digital really stand so hopefully those questions will be answered answered <clears throat> so i'm going to move forward so first i want to talk about the core see what we found at atl back in 2018 was a pretty phenomenal mobility business and entirely run with marketing and operation smarts we were uh, kind of our, our subscriber numbers were on the lower end but we were sitting at about 280 million customers at that point uh, and one thing that gopal did that was very smart is we had actually taken about 40 million customers and actually churned them from our base primarily because they were actually not profitable on the unit basis because they were taking a service paying us too little money and we couldn't service them back so that 40 million we removed were about 20 million uh we were sitting on a broadband base of 2 million customers and dtch was about 15 million right we also had access to about a million smes and 2000 enterprises in our b2b division so mobility broadband and then the live tv business called dtch and b2b and our digital footprint was about 15 million users who we could touch through our app <clears throat> see what's happened in the last three years we focused on this phenomena of digitization of digital transformation on the core and what came out of that was fascinating we're sitting on this 200 million digital footprint within the company broadband business has grown by 50% to 3 million customers mobility has grown to 320 million highest market share bharti has ever enjoyed in mobility is today and 17 million customers on our live tv business and our b2b business is also going gangbusters so generally business is doing well but what's happened to the dig- digital kind of influence on our business online share of revenue we are literally a 55% online company today and on that 50000 crore base 55% is significant revenue that is flowing through our online systems when you look at our call center and this is from year 20 to 21 If you go back to year 18, my entire budget. By the way, I wear the hat of experience at also at Atel. So all these call centers, email centers, social centers, all work with me. We had basically a very large budget, close to range of 1,200 crores, that we used to go after running all these contact centers. Today, that budget is at about 300 crores. That's a massive crash in the cost of operations. How do we do that? through digital journeys through bringing our consumers more online removing faults by fixing them and then catering to all that digitally so that kind of gives you the graph of how we are crashing our faults on the call center side acquisition you know we were a very heavy offline acquisition company any broadband acquisition dth acquisition mobility acquisition was all offline 0% online today 40% of our broadband acquisition is online and more and more of our businesses are moving acquisition also online that's a very big deal for a company like atel and because of this multiple service attach on the customers our churn also started going lower so earlier customers were mobility only then we focused on mobility and bank then we focused on mobility bank and entertainment and that started leading to that churn going down all these are effects of the concept of digital transformation just to give you a sense of how that moves metrics now here's the fascinating part i want to shift gears to platforms now when we digitized atel even though our core focus was on the mobility broadband dth b2b the atel digital team was also doing another interesting activity on the side we were not just digitizing we were also platformizing and that's a very important word in the language of tech and what does platformization mean let me give you an example let's take payments 
as an example, all the four businesses, mobility, DTH, broadband, B2B, they were all running on separate payment stacks. So the code, the engineering on payments was separate, done four times in the company. As we digitized, we also made sure that we bought these payment stacks together. And that's a very powerful move because now imagine four times the engineering team can be cut down to one engineering team. That's a huge asset because that's saving people who can then do other activities. Second, all the fault reduction is done once on the singular payment stack. It doesn't have to be done four times over. That concept is very powerful to make your core business strong. And these platforms we built, data, payments, distribution network, they're all at significant scale. So take a look at network itself, right? 320 million digital entities in the country, 95% coverage across. If I have network as a platform, it's a very powerful asset that I can reuse multiple times. Let's take a look at data. The data was siloed all across that room. When we bought it together, it's 1 billion touch points that's captured daily on Atl properties. 10 billion customer att attributes again captured daily, all in one huge repository. That power is incredible. We are bigger than most of the digital companies that you're aware of in terms of our data size. So it's a powerful asset. Take a look at payments. There's about 5 billion rupees worth of transactions happening daily when you bring all of Atl together. You keep it separate, then you don't see the scale. You bring it together, instantly there's scale. 55% transacting online. Distribution today, 200 million people that we can touch online and a million retailers all across the country that is connected digitally to us. And what do I mean by that? The retailer has an app through which we can send commands centrally as to what message that particular retailer needs to communicate to the end consumer who's physically standing outside his or her shop. All these assets are at scale. These are our platforms. By the way, I'm just giving you an example of the platforms. More platforms are getting created as we continue the digital transformation at Airtel. Now here's, the, here's where it gets very interesting. And for, for those of you who are doing business strategy, you all understand the concept of sweating your assets, which is if I build it once, I should be able to reuse again and again to build scale. That's the philosophy of our new businesses. Airtel today has a new business called Airtel Ads. It is a end-to-end first party ad ecosystem, very similar to how Amazon build their ads. We're running at about a $15 million run rate, all in just one year. And that's insane for any young startup to do. And I consider Atlas as a startup. It's a small team, which grew from eight engineers to today close to hundred people. And they are driving this revenue on top of Atlas. Atlas IQ, that's a cloud communication stack, very similar to Twilio in the US. Again, incubated within the year. We already have Extreme Video and Wink Music. That's two ongoing businesses that's running. More on the way. All these businesses have one thing in common. It leverages the platforms to get built. So when I jump forward, if you look at Atl Ads, Atl IQ, Wink Music and Extreme Video, all these businesses have been built at a fraction of cost. We don't have to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to build it because of the platforms we already have. So think of it as a Lego game. If I want to build Atl Ads, I'll take my distribution stack and I'll take my data stack, connect them together. 80% of the job is done. Then I'll add some code on top and launch the Atl Ads business. Atl IQ, it is a cloud communication suite. How did I build it? We built it using the network stack, network as a platform and data as a platform. Bought it together, some additional code, Atl IQ as a business. That's how we are creating these new businesses. Many, many more fun businesses being created. So Edl honestly operates like a group of startups right now. The core giving it solid revenue flow and platforms getting built out of the core, platforms leading to new businesses that we are generating. This is the ecosystem map. I just want to talk about Edl Ads so you get a sense of how we build it. <clears throat> when we first started the whole Edl Ads ecosystem, we basically only had one customer. That was Airtel. The tech team was enabling Airtel to take its own products to the 320 million customer base. That's how the journey started. We started building the systems in order to enable that. And this is your STP framework in marketing, right? 
how do you segment your customers go back to your data platform segment the customer bases so you know how to target them Sec second the targeting systems once you know the customers you have control of your channels online offline store call center and when the customer touches you you have the ability to send a message to them all these capabilities were developed for atel first then slowly but surely we extended that to our first non atel customer then the second today we work with 150 150 separate brands who use atel ads to reach consumers when we started the journey we probably had a billion impressions on our network today 10 billion impressions tomorrow the ten is going to grow further because these agile teams we have inside atel is constantly growing supply which is the impressions and then catering to brands like pepsi and cred to go advertise with us and every year the supply is growing and the demand is growing ads is nothing but a digital marketplace you connect a, a demand to the supply right so from that perspective we are growing this every year into a bigger and bigger business using agile principles so this is atel ads for you now if you look at the way we have designed all this this gives you a fair sense for what does the ecosystem strategy of atel look like it starts with before i shift to the next topic it starts with your core then it goes into your platforms then it goes into new businesses and whatever we don't build we partner right so for those of you doing a strategy for those of you who got a focus on entrepreneurship in order to be able to build something like this a strategy that looks something like this it will be helpful for you to build a career that is sprinkled with experiences experience of building you know different kind of experience of working in different kind of industries experience of working in different kind of functions experience of having built a small company and grown it and experience of starting in a big company and knowing what scale is all these comes together if you want to create something like what we have done at atel because it really takes tremendous amount of experience to bring all this together yeah and we've been very blessed with a lot of senior leaders and tremendous talent who's working together to bring this whole kind of vision into reality so this kind of blends into the next topic which is <clears throat> if you think about a career like a startup what can we really derive from building great companies what can we derive from that that we can apply to our careers so therefore we understand that there is a meaningful path to growing the career so that's going to be where i'm going to spend the next 10 15 minutes after which we can spend some time just talking any questions you may have <clears throat> so i'm just sharing a few anecdotes from how i saw my career grow and what i learned from various mentors you know through the course of that journey number 1 if you think about your career as an investment that you're making in a strategic asset which is yourself it could really turn the lens on how you think about planning your career and if you're a strategic asset let's think about a startup right startup is trying to becoming a, a strategic company to grow you need to kind of visualize your future self and what do i mean by that if you're a company you're trying to start up you will obviously think about the industry you want to enter the market size the addressable opportunity these are all things you're learning in business school why wouldn't you apply that to yourself i want to become a marine, marine biologist great what are you in it for is it for the money well then understand what the standard salary structures are understand what the big growth opportunities are is there a potential disruption that is possible in that area is that why you're entering understanding your future self really gives you a sense for which is the direction you want to catch now once you get the direction <clears throat> it is very helpful to build a vision now my vision when i was a kid was to become a startup a, a sorry um a fighter pilot in the air force it's okay it's a vision and that hopefully tunes you into all sorts of activities right why am i giving you this i want don't want to give you the feeling that everybody just wakes up with a vision whatever it is that you believe you want to do you can shape that into a vision from there i went to actually wanting to becoming a marine biologist to today I, i would argue like running a company is probably my vision right every successful startup has a clear vision in fact most founders get funded for their vision and if that is true why wouldn't all of you build out a vision to start with <clears throat> 
Now, I do want to caveat by saying it's okay to meander. A founder many times starts with a particular idea. They experiment. It may not work. It's okay. You can then try something else. So if you do not have a vision, nothing to worry about, at least build milestones so you know you're headed in a certain direction. And as you meander, just make sure that these milestones are carrying you forward. And one day, hopefully, you've gathered enough data, evidence, experiences go think about, to go think about a vision. So that's the career as an investment you're making in yourself as a strategic asset. Another thought, whatever you do, focus is very critical. And once you're focused, adjacencies become very important. Now let's take a look at the startup. What's the most important resource for a startup? Right? It's their resources and funding. Once you run out of that, it's, it's pretty challenging after that. If you then draw a parallel with your career, time is your most important asset. How do you want to spend it? Spend it in a way by which you're building something that is sustainable and hopefully you're staying happy in that process. Both are important. Second, startups who are successful in their core mission, they typically tend to diversify. Take Google, take, um, you know, in the early days even, right? They started with search. They started doing very well in search, good focus. But very quickly, they understood that content leads to search. They started diversifying into all sorts of content businesses. Anytime there is time spent by a human being, Google wants to be there. YouTube, right? Maps, all these, the intent was capture your eyeballs. So later they can monetize through search. So your focus initially should be to grow your skill. Land in one area and think really deep, but then expand. Explore adjacent skills and allocate time to train. Now three, startups who build core competencies and modes, they are the companies who last. Same way, your number one asset, if you're a strategic asset, your number one asset is your skill. Never compromise on skill development. Build capabilities. Don't try to go after short-term returns. If you do that, you are going to build something that's going to last. At least that's been my experience. Now, another very important thing, I get this question a lot. When you're building adjacencies, how do you focus? Do you go vertical or do you go horizontal? And both are choices. You know, I tell the story of Netflix. The top data scientist in Netflix gets paid almost the same amount as a C-level in the company. And the data science is a vertical play. Being a C-level in the company is a horizontal play. Both are profitable if you do them really well. So the choice you have to be very conscious about. When you invest in a particular skill, and then I said go to an adjacency, the adjacency can be a vertical adjacency. You could become a deep expert in, let's say, cloud. And let's say you're in the developer area. You're, you're learning so many technical skills around development. That's totally fine. You can have a fantastic career. Alternatively, you went from cloud to OS, then shifted gears, let us say, to um, the creator economy, then went for consulting. That's okay. You are now expanding horizontally. You're looking at different sectors. You're looking at different functions. That also could be very interesting if at one point in time, you bring all these skills together, right? And blend it to win. That's also possible. So the choice to make, whether it's vertical or horizontal, is something that you got to think through. Now there's a very interesting topic, picking your investor. Now for any founder, picking the investor is almost the most important thing they could do, especially in the early stages of the company. Because an investor can make or break you. And if you talk to a lot of the young startups, you will see this. Every startup will have those tough moments. The good investors will stick by them. The flaky investors will drop the hat and they leave. And it's, it's really the tough times that you want your investors to be with you. So when you look at the same angle, managers and mentors become a very important part of your journey. They are the ones who are going to shape you. They're the ones who are going to be with you during the tough times and the good times. And especially when you get to mid-career and future, I almost say, choose people over everything else. And for the last 15 years, I've done this. My number one pick is the people. Of course, it matters to me then, what is the company doing and is it gonna be successful and can I make it successful and all that. 
but people over everything else. Without people, I don't enter. So that's something to keep in mind as you develop your career. Another very important question is, you know, I get this question about how do you become a chief growth officer? How do you become a chief executive officer? You know, there is, there is no path that is cut out to become a chief of something. It ultimately goes back to your skills. And this is what I meant by develop your skills. Number one priority, right? I break down skills into five parts. Execution, strategy, vision, team building, and influence. During the early parts of your career, double down on execution and strategy. I see a lot of young talent in a rush to go into influence and vision when they have barely gotten their skills around execution and strategy nailed. I would definitely emphasize on getting execution and strategy nailed strong. If somebody gives you something to go get done, do you have the ability to go run with the team and land it? The how of landing it, have you practiced it? Market entry. How do you do market entry for a new product? How do you do competitive strategy? All these things are skills that you develop early phase of your career. Once you get those hard skills out of the way, your journey into leadership involves your ability to set the direction, which becomes vision. And setting direction is hard. The little bit of the example that you saw with Etel. Today, when I say to you, it may sound simple, but to stand in that tough situation where competition is in your face and to start clearly thinking about the future, laying the groundwork and then rallying teams to go after, that takes significant vision and clarity of mind to develop. That's a skill, but that's a skill you need to start developing once your foundational blocks are strong, which is strategy and execution. Second, can you rally a team? So how to structure a team, how to build a team, how to organize to win becomes another significant skill. And it is an underrated skill, but the best team builders are sometimes the best leaders because they understand the structure that needs to be set up and the people that need to be empowered to make a winning team. And last but not the least is influence. One of the most critical features of any exec that you will meet, the ability to not do command and control, but to rally people with influence, large swaths of people across functions, across sectors. They move because the leader is able to address to what their passion is, what their hunger is, and align them to move in a direction. That's influence. So later stages of your career, more focus on vision, team building, and influence. Earlier stages, execution and strategy. If you get these skills right, then you're on the right track. I always say, at some point in time in your career, you got to start defining values that matter to you. Early it might be hard because you're learning, you're figuring things out, that's okay. But later on in your career, when you even select a company, select a team to work with, it is important you understand what their value system is. And in order to understand what their value system is, you have to be clear on what, value, what values matter to you. And whenever you can make a good fit happen between your values, and the values you're entering, that's when you find flow in your work. Some of the values that you see here are the values I abide by, and it's something that I've checked with Etel, and Etel is also a fantastic company who believes in some of these values. So we've kind of brought this together into a value system inside Etel Digital. All these values you see here are from there. You can shape and develop your own values, but I think it's important to know who you are, and that starts with values. <clears throat> a very critical insight I've had over my career is, you know, you've heard it articulated in many different ways. Your career, your life is a marathon. The way I articulate that is, as long as you've got a growth mindset and you're moving, then your career is progressing. And the parts of what I mean by a growth mindset is go back to that visualizing yourself and the vision and the milestones. Plan and execute with clear success parameters each milestone. And take time, sometimes from your busy careers, to pause and take stock. When you all wrote your application essays for your business school, you probably all paused for a bit, took stock of your life, and then said, I am, here's why I want to come and join you. Repeat that all through your life. That's what I mean by plan, execute with clear success parameters. 
pause and take stock, and then measure how far you've come. And based on the measurement, you may make a bunch of decisions. You may say, double down. I'm doing really well. I'm having fun. There's so much more to learn. Let me keep investing. Alternatively, you'll come to a point that says, I think, you know, in the, in the vision I've painted for myself, I've learned enough. Now I want to pivot. I want to go try something else. Both are okay. As long as you've got a growth mindset and you're moving in the right direction. Yeah? Something very important to keep in mind as you plan the strategic asset that is yourselves. <clears throat> now, if you bring all this together, what does a good career look like? A good career is one where you build reputation. Now, reputation is not money. Reputation is not power. Reputation is you're known for doing something well. And what that is, is your choice. You can be the best nonprofit. You can be the most successful investment banker. Or you can be the person who's innovating like an Elon Musk, like changing the shape of the tech industry. But reputation is based on what you want to be. Yeah. But build a reputation and a career to last in the long run. And how do you do that? It's by building good values that you live by, developing the courage to follow these values, and then setting the standard for yourself that creates a lasting brand. And as you do all this, never forget to have fun. Enjoy the journey. You know, while I've had my ups and downs, when I look at the general direction I've been on, I've always been a very happy human being because of the choices I've made, both in life and at work. So keep that balance and enjoy the journey. And if you do that, you build a good reputation and you have a fantastic career in the long run.